Hello, I'm Chris Alvarez, and welcome to Military History Inside Out, brought to you by War Scholar. We talk about military history from ancient to modern times and everything in between. Are you a fan of World War II era music, culture, and fashion? Now is the opportunity to participate in a free ticket giveaway for the musical Bandstand playing at the National Theater in Washington, D.C. from March 3rd to 8th, 2020. From three-time Tony winner and Hamilton choreographer Andy Blankenbuehler comes an upbeat musical about American servicemen returning from World War II. Our hero, Private First Class Nowitzki, is a struggling singer and songwriter home for more. He enters a national music competition with fellow servicemen, and despite facing the impossible, they create a band that moves a nation and which will move you as well. More information about the show and the links to the ticket giveaway are on my website and the show notes. You can find more podcast episodes, written interviews, war games, and the most detailed military history timeline on the web at warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. We're on YouTube at warscholar1945. You can send comments and suggestions to info at warscholar.org. Thanks for listening. I'm speaking with Alexander Clifford, author of The People's Army in the Spanish Civil War, A Military History of the Republic and International Brigades, 1936 to 1939, uh, which will be published in April 2020 and in February in the United Kingdom uh, by Pen and Sword Books. Thank you for speaking with me. Thanks a lot for having me, Chris. Thank you. Very generous. So first, um, how did you get into studying uh, this subject and writing on it? Well, um, as a kind of teenager and at school and stuff, I was always interested in history, and particularly like the world wars. Um, and I began to learn a bit more as well about the interwar period, which is obviously, well, in my opinion, is a really kind of fascinating time period. You know, you've got the rise of extremes, you've got economic crisis, you've got all sorts of kind of cultural change as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when I went to university, uh, I was assigned a course in my very first term with uh, somebody called Dr. Peter Anderson, and it was about um, the historiography, the changing kind of narratives of the bombing of Guernica, uh, um, which mm-hmm. was an event in the Spanish Civil War. Um, which is kind of immortalized by a painting by Picasso where a town was um, kind of terror bombed by uh, German uh, planes. And the story um, of that and also of the kind of competing narratives of that history, like there was attempts to say that it was the other side who'd done it, there was all sorts of historical debate really kind of fascinated me because I, the more and more I learned, the more I realized the Spanish Civil War, which this bombing was part of, um, was really kind of contested history. There isn't like, say, with the Second World War, I'm generalizing here, but to a broad extent, you know, a a narrative that's accepted. The Spanish Civil War, even to some extent, even today, the history of it is really quite contested. So I, I... began to find it really um, a fascinating period of history. Um, It's got kind of everything, you know, it's got fascism, communism, democracy. Um, It's got a huge societal and cultural aspects to it, but also obviously a military perspective, which I've kind of looked into. And all the kind of big names of the 1930s, both kind of politically Stalin, Hitler, Mussolini, but also culturally, people like George Orwell, Ernest Hemingway, Picasso, I've just mentioned, all kind of get themselves involved in the Spanish Civil War. So the more I kind of learned about it, the more fascinated I was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, one of the things about uh, the Spanish Civil War that strikes me is that it feels like it's the first war in the modern era, in the 20th century, where there was a large-scale execution of of prisoners civilian and military by both sides you know sort of presaging the the whole you know genocidal killing of your opponents um absolutely yeah i don't know if if that's correct my understanding if it is the first or if there were other earlier conflicts that did it but but this one seemed to really go at it pretty hard yeah i mean one of the things as well that is 
it is so interesting about it is the kind of you know passionate visceral hatred of the two sides of course you know the two sides who are predominantly both made up of Spaniards but the brutality of the war is really um, something that's quite shocking in terms of particularly like you say the behind the lines killings of civilians and prisoners I mean certainly it's to a greater extent than you saw you know in the First World War um, and it presages what we see in the Second World War on a quite a large scale and I think part of that is because to some extent like the Second World War it's an ideological conflict um, where there is really extremes of both sides involved um, you kind of see the methods of colonial warfare which you know the kind of brutality and, and murder we're talking about had been seen in more colonial wars in the 19th and early 20th century, but they were kind of happening far away from the Western eye, if you like, you know, to what they would have then called kind of native populations. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is the first time, other than perhaps you might say the Russian Civil War, but again, that even, you know, in, in, at that time, that did feel, I think Russia was further away than even it is today if you get my meaning um, from the kind of western perspective so this was the first time I think you saw that mass killing um, on an industrial scale applied to kind of western Europe and being in the, the media focus of the western world mm -hmm. so um, let's talk about how you uh, structure the book um, I assume it's chronological um, but then how, like thematically, how do you explore um, the, your subject matter? Sure. So I um, set out to write this book really because it was a topic that I, it was a book that I kind of wish had been out there when I started studying the Spanish Civil War in that um, there hadn't really been a, in the English language, a proper military history of the Spanish Civil War, a couple of actually um, come out in the last few years um, and there also hadn't been really a book about the Republican side militarily speaking in the Spanish Civil War there were plenty written about Republican politics and um, that sort of thing but there hadn't been a book about the kind of Republican army really so to speak there had been there's a really great study by somebody called uh, Michael Alpert of the Republican Army, but it's it's very much a kind of academic piece, basically a kind of structural organizational history. It doesn't um, tell the story. You know, it, it's not a narrative. It, it only kind of mentions battles in passing as, as something that the army was involved in. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to go out and basically tell the story, give you a narrative of the Spanish Civil War, from a military perspective and from the point of view primarily of this Republican army, which was, um, I'm sure we're going to talk about this, quite a remarkable and unique army. So what I do is I um, set up briefly uh, the context of why Spain had a civil war in 1936. The two sides, I then kind of drop into briefly the political aspect of each side and then in more detail the armies of each side by about early kind of 1937 which is when the two sides almost kind of settled down and organized themselves properly because the war started out initially as a, as a coup attempt that failed so it was a bit haphazard at the start and then I basically go through three major battles that the Republicans initiated over the course of 1937 <laughs> Um, which have, to some extent, been overlooked, I would say, um, particularly compared to the kind of last major battle of the war, the Ebro, um, gets a lot of coverage. But I've looked at three that have, have not really been written about in English as much, and then taken those three and kind of drawn the lessons from them and what they tell us about the Republican army and why they ended up losing. And then I, I carry the narrative to the end of the war. Mm -hmm. So let me give you my impression of what the two sides uh, were like from, from mm -hmm. what I've read, and then you can correct me or adjust my thinking. Um, <laughs> okay. So the fascist side or the Franco side seemed to be made up of, of pretty much conservative professional mm -hmm. soldiers, mm 
their Moorish mercenaries, and then yep. mechanized uh, support from, say, Germany and Italy with air power and maybe tanks and, and artillery, whereas the Republican side seemed to be more, some professional soldiers, but more uh, a ragtag combination of, of local militias, some professional soldiers, more light infantry, not as much um, mechanized troop transport or that sort of thing, and then some yep. advisors from the Soviet Union, and then some of the international brigades, which again seem to be just like light infantry, um, mm -hmm. kind of thrown together. So that's sort of what I see on both sides. And you tell me where I'm right and wrong. You're, you know, you're pretty close to the mark. Um, a lot of people, when I mean, a lot of people know not very much about the Spanish Civil War, to be honest. Um, but the image they have it in their head is often kind of. I think people imagine it almost like a guerrilla conflict. Um, maybe that's because of um, the fact, the photographs you see, often troops look quite like militia troops, irregular troops. Um, and maybe even it's down to the kind of cultural representations of it. Um, it's guerrilla warfare is what's portrayed by Hemingway in his novel, uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls. And also um, the... The film Pan's Labyrinth from about 15 years ago mm. portrays guerrilla warfare, but actually it was not a guerrilla war. Um, and you're pretty near to the mark. Um, the Francoists, uh, the, at the time they were often labelled fascists, um, were made up of the majority of the Spanish army. The Spanish army launched a coup, but it, the army kind of split. It wasn't the whole army going against the government in July 1936. It was the majority of it, particularly the majority of the elite troops and the, the officer corps. Um, but that forms the basis of the, of the uh, Francoist or nationalist side. And then, like you mentioned, they have the um, elite Moroccan troops um, who were really um, quite feared uh, during the Spanish Civil War which they recruit from uh, northern Morocco, which was a kind of colony of Spain at the time, a protectorate. They also have the Spanish Foreign Legion, um, which was another elite kind of organization, which was actually 90% Spanish rather than foreign. Um, but they were also kind of shock troops. And the kind of crucial aspect as well that you mentioned was the Italian and German uh, support offered by Hitler and Mussolini to the to General Franco. I'm speaking with Alexander Clifford, author of The People's Army in the Spanish Civil War, A Military History of the Republic and International Brigades, 1936 to 1939. You can find Alexander on Twitter at History's Most. That's History S Most. Uh, and that's associated also with a podcast titled History's apostrophe S Most. If you like this podcast, Please rate it and like it on whatever podcast feed you're listening to it on. Also, please visit warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com and warscholar1945 on YouTube to get more interesting uh, military history information. And don't forget to like and follow me on those if, uh, if you're enjoying what I'm presenting to you. Now back to the podcast. The Germans sent... I would say the easiest way of uh, putting it is... The Germans were very much quality over quantity, and the Italians, the inverse, you know, quantity over quality. So the Germans sent uh, the Condor Legion, which was a fairly small, it was probably never more than about 5,000 at any one time, although probably as many as 20,000 Germans served in it over the course of the war. The biggest contingent of it was a big kind of Luftwaffe detachment with... Um, Lots of kind of the names that you'd recognize if you're familiar with the Second World War, you know, the Messerschmitt 109, Heinkel 111, uh, the Stuka dive bomber. They kind of tried out all these weapons and, and, and uh, vehicles for the first time in Spain. And also a, a small number of tanks, a good amount of artillery sent by the Germans. The Italians... Um, basically go to war with the Spanish Republic because they commit about 80,000 um, Italian military personnel to Spain. There's something called the CTV, which is a uh, semi-mechanized force. Uh, it speaks about 50,000 men, which just fights. 
you know, as regular troops. Uh, they also commit the majority of Franco's air force is Italian planes and pilots as well. So um, the Italians commit a lot to Spain um, to the extent that it probably held them back in the Second World War because they would used up so much of their resources in Spain. Hmm. But the quality is not quite there with the Italians. Um, the CTV's military record is quite mixed and their tanks that they used were just kind of little tankettes. Um, little two-man vehicles with machine guns and flamethrowers. So not exactly kind of the blitzkrieg you'd imagine of um, a few years later. Mm -hmm. On the Republican side, um, as I mentioned, the army split. So a small uh, section of the army stayed loyal to the Republicans. About 2,000 professional officers serve in the Republican army. It comes to be known as the People's Army, um, hence the title of the book. Uh, and they... They were often soldiers who were retired, uh, these professional officers, or were a bit older. The generation that was younger tended to side with the nationalists. Um, you had like, roughly about half the security forces, the armed police, back in the Republic. And then, like you mentioned, in order to try and stop the military coup, the government in the first few days of the war had distributed arms to um the workers and the peasants who were politically sympathetic to the Republic. So these militias, a huge, like you said, ragtag array of militias from different political organizations, different trade unions, you had anarchist, communist, socialist, um, more kind of liberal organizations, all forming militias, which were very haphazard, um, you know, not trained, obviously, um, just given guns not really have any heavy weapons. And the kind of first, I'd say third of my book is the story of how the Republic tried to integrate these elements that they had, a few loyalist officers, large body of kind of militia, and they also introduced conscription as well, integrated all this together to produce something resembling a regular army. Um, because that's really from the autumn of 36 through to the spring of 37, that's what they tried really desperately to do, mm -hmm. is get rid of the militias because they recognised how inefficient they were. I mean, some of the militias, you know, they would go home on the weekend or um, <laughs> they would um, kind of refuse to dig trenches because they thought it would be cowardly or they would vote on the orders they received of whether or not they should accept them. So there was a real internal struggle in the Republic to try and reform the militias, turn them into a proper regular army, um, give them a bit of training, give them a bit of heavy weapons, which they relied really from two sources for these, these weapons, which is, as you said, the Soviet Union, which committed um, not quite as much as the Italians in terms of sheer amount of equipment and certainly a lot less in terms of personnel. There was about 2,000 communist advisors in Spain, sorry, Soviet advisors in Spain at any one time. Um, plane crews and tank crews, they did send. Um, so the Republic had an okay selection of Soviet tanks, planes, but the small arms and the artillery that the Soviets sent was really not up to scratch um, for the most part. And they didn't actually, one of the things that I've kind of picked up on that I haven't really seen mentioned much before is the fact that the Soviets only sent a few million, I think two, two to three million artillery shells, which sounds a lot. Mm -hmm. But when you think about some of the great battles, for example, in the First World War, you could have a million artillery shells used in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So the Republic never had particularly the heavy weaponry to mount a successful offensive in modern warfare. Because, you know, if you think about the first, but even the second world war, if you send infantry up against a defensive position, machine guns, barbed wire, unless you've got some pretty hefty artillery support or air support, you're going to lose a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really one of the, the huge deficiencies that the public suffers. They try and buy stuff on the black market as well, but they're barred from buying weapons legitimately. Um, so in the end, um, although they kind of form a more regular army, 
supported, as you said, by the uh, International Brigade's volunteers from abroad, who I'm sure, again, we'll, we'll get a chance to talk about. They don't have the heavy weaponry um, available to launch a kind of successful offensive in, in, a, in a modern kind of war. Sort of a, an aside, I believe that um, didn't the uh, Republican government transfer its national treasury to the Soviet Union for safekeeping and the Soviets just ended up keeping it? And first, is, <laughs> have you come across that? And also, yeah. did the Soviets give back in return what they were, you know, uh, a equal mm -hmm. value of what they received? Yes, that's a very good question. Um and something that historians have debated really since the uh, since the Civil War, the Republic was could because it was the government of Spain, they controlled the gold reserves of Spain, so they could have gone out and bought you know a whole load of military hardware just from companies you know, but very quickly after the Civil War starts, Britain, America, um, the French as well basically agree to a policy of non-intervention. So we're not going to get involved because we don't want the civil war to blow up into a bigger you know, world war. And we're also going to bar the import of any military resources or weapons into Spain to try and contain the conflict. And this was supposed to be even-handed. You know, Both the Franquists and the Republicans wouldn't be able to buy weapons on the international market. But as I've kind of laid out, you know, Franco had Hitler and Mussolini who were, you know, perfectly willing to defy international agreements um, to give them the weapons they needed. Um, and the Soviets, again, were, able, were willing to supply the Republicans regardless. But because a uh, Republican government, the Republican government couldn't just go out and buy weapons in the traditional way a government would, they ended up basically having to rely on Soviets and on the kind of black market. There was a few other sympathetic governments, Mexico, um, Czechoslovakia, but they didn't really have the resources. Um, so you're right, the Spain's gold reserves, a large share of it, ends up being transported to Moscow to be used almost like a current account to just buy weaponry from, because the Soviet aid was was really not aid, they had to buy it. Um, whereas the Italians and the Germans provided Franco with the resources either on credit, so have it now, pay us when we've when you've won the war, or they provided it in exchange for mineral resources. Mm. So the Republicans needed to buy the stuff off the Soviets, so Stalin, you know, wasn't overly generous and Although some of the stuff he provided, the tanks like the T-26 or the planes like the I-16, were very decent for the mid-30s. A lot of the stuff as well, he kind of took the opportunity to offload old stuff from the First World War, from the, even the Russia-Japanese War, even before that, onto the Republicans who kind of didn't have a choice but to buy this stuff because they just needed you know, material, they needed weapons and no one else would sell it to them. The only other place they could get it, as I mentioned, was kind of the black market, and that, they got ripped off even more. Um, for example, Poland um, sold them a load of stuff on the black market. Poland was not sympathetic to the Republicans politically, but they just wanted to make some money. Mm. Um, so Poland, for example, sold them um, a few FT-17 Renault tanks from the First World War, which were pretty much useless to be honest but they sold them at a much higher price than the soviets were selling the t26 for so they were charging way more for a tank that was 20 years yeah. out of date hmm. um so although definitely you can say the soviets ripped off uh, the republicans with some of this um because they knew they had them over a barrel they were even worse off with the other people they were trading with it almost seems that so so I noticed in your book, you focused on um, three battles. I think it was mm -hmm. in 1937 where you said things could have gone either way, like either side could have won. Mm -hmm. And it makes me wonder, so we can talk about that, but also it seems as though the Soviet Union, if they had given just a little more, maybe it could have pushed things over the edge in favor of the Republicans. But mm 
maybe since they already had their money, did it's almost like there wasn't an incentive to help them win yeah. at this point, except for political reasons. Yeah. I'll kind of deal with those in turn. So first of all, 1937, I focused in on it in particular um, because that was the point where the sides were most even. Um, as things stood, I'm not entirely convinced, even if those battles had gone the Republic's way, that in the end the Republic could have won the Civil War just because of all the advantages the Nationalists had in terms of um, both the quality of their troops and the, the quality of the support they received. On the other hand, if the Republic had achieved a series of military victories in 1937, it would have prolonged the war, I, I'm fairly confident. And that was the best shot they had. That, Like I said, that was when the Republican People's Army was at its strongest. Um, so had they been able to pull off one or two successful offensives in 1937, maybe the war would have lasted longer. And given that the war finished in April of 1939, and of course September 1939, you have second world, the Second World War breaks out. Mm. Had the war lasted a bit longer, who you know? Who knows? I'm not going to kind of speculate whether you know, it would have been drawn into the wider World War or, or whatever. But 1937, I think, is really interesting because it's when the Republic is militarily at its strongest. They've got their act together after the militias in the first few months of the war. They have a decent level of support, at least for the first half of 1937, from um, from the Soviets. And so they've got a shot at at least achieving some level of military success, which um, which is why I kind of investigated it uh, the most. Um, on your second question, it is really interesting, the Soviet aid. On one hand, you can't really start saying, well, the Soviets should have done more when it was the Soviets who were the only ones helping the Republic. Um, you know, if they hadn't had any Soviet aid, the war would have been finished way, way quicker. On the other hand... By kind of the second half of 1937, the Soviets and Stalin begins to lose interest in the Republicans and the civil war in Spain. And so there is, I believe, there is no Soviet arms shipments between August 1937 and June 1938, which is a long way and a long period of time when the Republic is fighting some of its biggest battles to be completely deprived of aid. To kind of explain that, you you have to look at uh, Soviet motivations, like why was Stalin supporting the Republic at all? I think on the surface, people would say, well, you know, Stalin, the Soviet Union is obviously a communist country. They're interested in spreading communism. And the left-wing socialist communist cause in Spain looks like a kind of ideal opportunity. However... I think that view is to a large extent coloured by what happens 10, 20, 30 years later in the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So after, you know, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union definitely was trying to, you know, export communism through military aid to, say, you know, the North Vietnamese, North Koreans, um, Angola even, you know what I mean. So the Soviet Union definitely was trying to spread its sphere of influence around the globe. In the 30s, that was still obviously in the future, right? Mm -hmm. The Soviets were not yet in a position to be kind of trying to turn countries red, at least through military means. Um, when you actually look at the time of Stalin's thinking and also the kind of diplomatic um, wranglings that were going on, he had just signed a um, collective security agreement with France because Stalin's biggest concern was that in the future there was going to be a war with Germany, with Hitler. Um, and he knew the Soviet Union probably wasn't ready and by itself wouldn't be able to defeat Nazi Germany. Mm. So he was looking to build a kind of collective security pact with France, which he succeeded in, and he was hoping to include Britain as well, kind of rebuild the old alliance from the First World War and kind of surround Germany. That was reflected in kind of Communist Party policy, which dramatically shifted after Hitler's rise to power from being communist parties around the world who took their orders from Moscow, you need to try and instigate revolutions, to being communist parties around the world, you need to try and form alliances with other left-wing and other liberal parties to stop the rise of fascism, a kind of idea called the Popular Front. Mm -hmm. um, 
So when the war in Spain broke out, Stalin at first was um, quite happy to go along with France and Britain and say non-intervention. But then a few months into the war, it became clear that Hitler and Mussolini aren't abiding by non-intervention. It looks like Franco might win. So if you get a fascist Spain, you've got France, which is Stalin's only ally on planet Earth, really, because the Soviet Union is a pariah state. Hmm. Um, France would be surrounded on three sides. They'd have, obviously, Germany next door to the west, sorry, to the east. You'd have Italy to the southeast, and you'd have Spain to the southwest. So Stalin and Soviet kind of policymakers thought, yes, we've got this deal with France for a future war against the fascist powers, but France might, you know, might be surrounded (laughs) and not really be much of a good ally, not be able to help us. So there's actually a fascinating um, letter from the British ambassador in Moscow back to his government back in London saying, for Stalin, Spain is all about the security of France, um, which is a (laughs) kind of wacky kind of concept, really, I think. Um, The fact he's going to intervene in the civil war in Spain to preserve the security of France. But um, the primary aim was that, look, we'll stop the fascist powers winning in Spain, preserve the security situation of France. Hopefully, Stalin was optimistic in the first few months of the war that Britain and France would kind of wake up and see that, hang on, a fascist Spain is not good for our interests. So we should also help the Republicans. And he really thought, well, if Britain, France and Russia are all helping the Republicans, we're all going to become friends and alliance is going to grow out of that. Ironically, France and Britain never did. And in fact, the opposite happened. Both Italy and Germany helped out uh, Franco Mm -hmm. and their relationship became much closer because of that. And actually in October 1936, they signed the kind of Axis Agreement which flowers into the Second World War alliance. Mm -hmm. Um, So once Stalin realizes, hang on, Britain and France have absolutely no interest in saving the Republic, and also once it becomes clear that probably the Republic isn't going to win, and also once um, serious fighting starts in China, where there's a communist um, uh, faction that Stalin's interested in supporting, he basically just starts losing interest. and he realizes that actually Britain and France are not going to ride to my rescue. I need to look after myself. And this kind of alters his foreign policy in 1937, 1938. And it finally comes down to the famous uh, Nazi Soviet pact of 1939, mm. which is like, right, Britain and France are flaky allies. They're never going to help me. So I'm going to buy more time for myself by making a deal with the Nazis. Mm. So the the communist aspect of this of this war, um, I want to bring in the international brigades here. Sure, yeah, um, good timing. So, so one of the questions I have, or one of the things I note, is that there were various flavors of communism being bandied about among the participants in the Spanish Civil War. You know, it seemed to be like there's the Trotskyites, and then there's yeah. the Stalinists. You know, there's a more rigid and a more relaxed, and and at times it seems they, and then you have the anarchists, and it seems mm. like there was at least one point where they came to blows in some city for, for a couple of weeks um, yeah. that George Orwell was, was, I think he was the one present at that he battle. Was, yeah. Um, he was, yeah. The Republic, one of the weaknesses with the Republic is that it is, as you kind of laid out there, very divided politically. So within the Republican side, you've got parties that would call themselves um, Republican, um, like, say, Republican Union or the Republican Left, which were basically liberal parties that favoured a republic rather than a monarchy. Um, so obviously not the US meaning of the term Republican. Mm-hmm. Um, you had the Socialist Party, which was um, a kind of left-wing party split between some of them who were more pro-revolutionary and some of them who were more more pro-democracy and reform. Then you've got the anarchists or the anarcho-syndicalists who don't even participate in elections because they think the state is all a facade and it needs to be got rid of. 
and we should all just live in kind of anarchist communes where the workers and peasants cooperate. Then you've got the Spanish Communist Party, which is Stalinist, which takes its orders from Moscow. Then you've got a party called the PUM, uh, which was kind of a semi-Trotskyist group. Its leader had been Trotsky's secretary. Um, and as you can imagine, these factions don't get on. <laughs> um, they have diff very different ideas. Um, broadly speaking, you can divide them into two camps because the main political controversy was um, war versus revolution. So what should be the priority of the republic? Should it be carrying through a genuine social revolution? Or should it be fighting the civil war and beating the fascists? And to do that, we need you know, unity. We need to bring everyone along with us. So a revolution is not a good idea. Hmm. Um, so the Republican groups I mentioned, the more moderates in the Socialist Party and the Communist Party of Spain were the war faction, i.e., you know, we're people from different classes of different ideologies. We just need to unite and be Franco. Let's not worry about collectivizing the land or, you know, having worker control over factories, that sort of thing. On the other side, the anarchists and the, um, the Poom, the semi kind of Trotskyist party, were very much like, no. This is the opportunity now for social revolution. They, for example, were against the formation of the People's Army. They preferred the militia system as being like a genuine democratic revolutionary army, whereas they saw the People's Army as being, oh, well, you're just making us like we were before. You know, the army rebelled against the government, and now you're just building another army. Mm -hmm. Haven't you learned from your mistakes? And this, this argument really is is so divisive on the Republican side. And like you mentioned, in May 37, you have an event called the May Days where it plays out in force. So you have the Catalan, it's in Barcelona, the Catalan regional government tries to take back over the telephone exchange, which was quite important because it controlled communication um, in Barcelona, which had been under worker control. So anarchists and Poom think that's great. The war side, the communists, liberals and socialists kind of think, mm, no, that's not great. It should be under government control. And it basically turns into an armed clash between basically the government forces and the anarchists and the Putin militia. And like I say, George Orwell was in Barcelona at that time. He was part of the, the Putin, um militia and basically the, the war side of the argument win out um, and the poom is pretty brutally crushed by soviet secret service um because obviously stalin doesn't like trotskyists um mm. and the anarchists have to basically take second place within the republican faction um so one of the really kind of difficult things with the republic is this constant um political infighting of Included in this in the book a few reports of the fact that um, anarchist units would complain that you know communist commanders wouldn't share weapons and equipment with them. So you had a situation where anarchist units were often really badly equipped. I mean, in the context of an army that is already badly equipped, mm -hmm. whereas all the best weapons and equipment were saved for the kind of communist units. And definitely there's a sense that that chipped away at morale and the unity. Um, on the other hand, there is an argument to make that actually you should prioritise what little weapons and equipment you have for the reliable units. And like I've set out, the anarchist kind of militia-based units were anything but reliable in terms of you know the training, the discipline, the morale. And a number of the kind of communist units are within the context of the People's Army, which is not a particularly successful army, are the more successful units that become the kind of reliable shock troops that get used time and again for the difficult tasks. So maybe you would want to give them your best equipment. Ah, I see. I'm speaking with Alexander Clifford, author of The People's Army in the Spanish Civil War, A Military History of the Republic and International Brigades 1936 to 1939. You can find Alexander on Twitter at History's Most. That's History S Most.
uh, and that's associated also with a podcast titled Histories, apostrophe S, Most. If you like this podcast, please rate it and like it on whatever podcast feed you're listening to it on. Also, please visit warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com and warscholar1945 on YouTube to get more interesting uh, military history information. And don't forget to like and follow me on those if, uh, if you're enjoying what I'm presenting to you. Now back to the podcast. So um, it also seems that uh, the Republican side had their their best uh, moments was it in the urban areas and the semi-urban fighting um, that they had they were able to um, fight better or is that um, misperception on my part probably the greatest military triumph of the Republic was the defense of Madrid in late 1936 which was like a you know urban siege warfare um, and to a large extent, it was probably because the nationalist forces were at that time very much made up of the Moroccan troops that we mentioned a little while back um, and the Spanish Foreign Legion, and their experience was in kind of colonial warfare. So they, so, you know, they were pretty effective in southern Spain, which is rural and kind of arid. But when they got to urban fighting, well, you know, anyone who knows anything about military history knows that urban fighting is very bloody and difficult. And so their skill set of kind of um, infiltration techniques and sneaking around the flanks didn't really work in a, in a obviously major city. And the deficiencies of the Republican side in, say, like the militias was to some extent hidden by the fact that in an urban battle, you just need to hold yourself up in a building and fire out the windows and you're very hard to dislodge um, they also probably the most successful offensive operation they launched was um, Terror Well which is a battle that I cover in some detail in the book um, which was a uh, in an offensive in the winter of 1937-8 where the Republicans encircle the city of Terror Well and gradually kind of clear out the city and they, they were able to do that fairly successfully. Unfortunately, it ends up being a bit like the Battle of Stalingrad where, you know, the Germans committed to trying to clear through the city, but then the Soviets uh, hit them on the flanks and surrounded Stalingrad. And obviously that was a disaster mm. for the Wehrmacht. Similarly, in Teruel, even though the Republican army actually captures the city, the Franquists launch a huge counteroffensive that basically cuts off Terror Well and the besiegers become the besieged and they are forced to basically give up everything they'd gained. So what few Republican real successes we can see, it's an interesting point that, yeah, it was um, urban battles. Um, when they kind of launched an offensive in the, in the, in the countryside, like, say, Brunetta, the lack of heavy equipment, the lack of real tactics and training shows itself badly when they're trying to advance in the open or up hills and you come up, like I mentioned, against machine guns, artillery, and you, you get cut down. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the uh, International Brigades. Where, where did they come from and how much did they really contribute to, um, say, the battles you, you focus on in the book? Sure. That's, for me, it's one of the most interesting aspects of the Spanish Civil War more generally, but also of the People's Army, the Republican Army, is, well, the International Brigades, because there is um, very few examples similar in terms of the scale of the International Brigades. Yeah, you do obviously have various conflicts where you get foreign volunteers, but around about between 32 and 35,000 people from around the globe um, come and join the International Brigades to fight for the Republic. They come from, I think, uh, around 50 different nations, um, predominantly European nations, because they're obviously close at hand, but, but all around the world um, to some extent. And they form some of the kind of more dedicated and reliable troops within the People's Army, because, you know, if you think about it, if you're willing to travel around halfway around the world, cross borders, often... 
you know, illegally. It was, a, you know, in many countries it was illegal to go and enlist in a foreign army, not least the USA and the UK. So if you're willing to risk all of that and go and fight in someone else's civil war, they tend to be quite ideologically committed. So ugh, around, uh, the figures are not great because the Republic lost the war, so all the Republican, you know, records and things get lost. Um, but around about 70% of them were communists, um, and the rest would have been generally people of left-wing views, um, members of, of different political organizations or trade unions. Um, so unlike most people's army units, which were conscript-based or, um, you know, people like, say, anarchist units who, as we kind of mentioned, their their commitment or their, their willingness to kind of go along with the Republican government was sometimes questionable, hmm. you had quite a strong esprit de corps in the international brigades um, it does get worn down over time, but definitely in the first kind of year of the war, it is very visible. How did the, the Republican government, um, did they, I mean, the, these people could have left at any time, you know, it's it's sort of, you know, volunteer army. Yeah, the volunteers were usually recruited by the Communist Party of each nation. So, for example, in Britain, to sign up, you had to go down to Communist Party headquarters in London They'd give you an interview, they would kind of screen you, see if you were kind of really wanted to go or or not. Then you'd get transported. They were kind of gathered up volunteers from all countries into Paris, snuck across um, the border into Spain. And um, initially it was controlled by the Comintern, the Communist International. So they were kind of Moscow funded and organized. Um, and this question of leave or even leaving full stop was something that really became a problem by about midnight 37 because they found out that you know this was a pretty horrific war where the international brigades kept getting used again and again and again in the toughest spots whether it be spearheading an offensive or plugging a gap in the line when you're under attack and the casualty rates were just um insane you know, really, really, they suffered a lot um, because, you know, their equipment, as we've said, wasn't great. They didn't have much in the way of artillery support. The Francoists from mid-1937 always had air superiority. And like I've kind of mentioned, a lot of Republican offensives end up being troops being sent to charge up against defensive positions without proper artillery support. And it becomes a bloodbath. So, you had a lot of demoralization in the international brigades as this goes on. It just struck me um, that a lot of the, a lot of the, um, there, there were very uh, accomplished people um, mm -hmm. who joined up, and it strikes me how you know the ones who you know you have Orwell and Hemingway and others who survived and, and had great literary careers, and then you think about the others who didn't make it, who you know you imagine what contributions they might have made um, in the future had they lived. Yeah, it, the cause of the Spanish Republic was kind of certainly unique for the time in that it attracted a huge amount of kind of intellectual supporters, um, you know, figures from the literary or artistic world. Not all of them um, joined up to fight. Um, often they would kind of more use their writing to support the Republic and um, that sort of thing. But there was um, plenty who... Who, who did, I mean, uh, the first British volunteer for the Republic who died um, was actually a woman, a sculptor called Felicia Brown, um, an artist who was in her early 20s. And again, you know, you just imagine kind of a lot of these people, what career they might go on to have had. On the other hand, a lot of my research um, has kind of thrown light on the fact that there is a bit of a, because of the fact that some of these figures were so high profile, there's a bit of a, romanticization and a misconception that the international brigades were full of poets and writers and things. Mm -hmm. Probably there are about 80% of the volunteers were working class, um, you know, laborers and factory workers and uh, miners and dockers. And it kind of isn't really surprising when you think that, you know, these are mostly communists or left wingers, um, that you have a heavy contingent of working class recruits. Um, 
Orwell actually is an interesting one because he um, went to Spain to join the POOM, the Trotskyist group I mentioned. Um, their militia kind of sat about on a quiet front, not doing very much. He was in the May Day's violence. We talked about the internal clash. He intended to join the international brigades and trans, kind of transfer, um, but he never went through with it. Um, so if he had done, you know, I think about 93% of volunteers for the international brigades were either killed or wounded. Wow. So that includes that minor wounds, um, but, you know, it's a very high loss rate. So who knows, mm -hmm. maybe we'd never have got Animal Farm or 1984. Mm -hmm. um, Hemingway, he went uh, to Spain and wrote um, journalistic pieces, and he liked to get close to the front, but he, uh, he never signed himself up um, to, to, to fight either, which, again, perhaps for the mm -hmm. literary world was, was fortunate. Um, but they, they found that despite the kind of strong ideological commitment of these volunteers, when you're suffering loss races like that, sorry, loss rates like that, um, it was really um, kind of unsustainable. And they ended up having to fill up the international brigades with Spanish conscripts because there just wasn't enough people coming anymore from abroad. Mm -hmm. So their quality was really diluted over time and their combat effectiveness definitely declined as a result. Um, and I think going to your point of what did we lose with the international brigades, you lost a lot of people who were exceptional within the kind of left-wing movements, movements of their home countries. Mm -hmm. um, so just to name a few examples, um, there was a guy called Lewis Clive um, killed. He was a British volunteer who was he was um, a young man in the uh, British Labour Party. He was a descendant of the 18th century general Clive of India. He was also an Olympic gold medal winning swimmer, um, kind of multi-talented guy, but uh, supposedly also a great leader on the battlefield. But, you know, he was killed again. What sort of career might he have had? Um, there was also um, a... Quite an interesting aspect of it was that you had, this was the first time ever that there was black Americans commanding white Americans mm. in combat, because obviously the American military was segregated even in, say, the Second World War. Um, so you had um, a number of African American volunteers in the International Brigades. Really interesting to read some of the things they write. One of the interesting things about the black volunteers, the African-American volunteers in the American units was the fact that they linked the cause, the, the fight in Spain, to the fight for equality and civil rights in the United States. And they kind of saw that the racism in the Deep South was drawn from the same prejudices as, say, fascism in Spain. Um, Oliver Law um, was a... African-American commander in the what was called the George Washington Battalion of the International Brigades. Uh, he was killed at Brunetta. And again, you kind of think almost like, you know, a generation before the likes of, say, Martin Luther King, you had these um, left-wing and uh, African-Americans going out to Spain. You also had another kind of um, individual who kind of stands out, a guy called... Um, Robert Merriman, who was a economist, actually, an American economist at uh, Berkeley. And he had gone to Moscow to study kind of the economics of Stalin's regime. And then the civil war in Spain broke out. He, he wasn't actually a communist. He was not a member of any political party. And he went over to Spain because he felt like, you know, he felt a moral obligation he sent to do so. He um, was the first commander of the Americans in Spain, got wounded in one of their first battles, made his way back eventually, um, but also uh, was killed. And he was considered a really kind of great leader, but also a kind of great, potentially a great mind. You know, a lot of these volunteers were young men in their 20s. So who knows kind of what they might have gone on to do, whether it be in politics or the intellectual fields. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the aspects of the Spanish Civil War that I think is really fascinating and unique is this 
this this example of the international brigades and these people who whether it's through political conviction moral conviction felt it necessary to go and fight in a, in a foreign civil war mm-hmm. so let's turn to uh the resources you used for for the research um mm-hmm. what what did you use um for this book obviously a, a variety of sources um my starting point as obviously an english speaker was to look at there's a huge plethora of um, international brigade literature, um, a lot by obviously surviving veterans, a lot uh, by scholars as well. It's it's something that's been studied a lot. That's the kind of aspect, I would say, of the Spanish Civil War that in the English-speaking world has been studied the most. So I started with that, and perhaps at first I wasn't quite sure the project. I thought maybe it would be about the international brigades at first. But the more I read about it, the more I kind of felt like the people who've written about the international brigades haven't tended to be um, necessarily students of military history. Mm -hmm. Often the international brigades are looked at from a social or an international or a kind of political perspective. You know, often, you know, historians who have an interest in, say, left-wing movements will look at the international brigades. So they'll be primarily, you know, looking at it at a political point of view. Mm -hmm. And I began more and more to think, I want to kind of investigate the military history side of this. You know, how effective were they fighting at fighting? What difference did they make? And as I kind of tried to find out more about that, read more generally around the Spanish Civil War, I identified, well, the army they were part of, the Republican People's Army, has not been written about really in English very much. So I kind of dove into that. And because it's not written really very much in English, other than Michael Alpert's study I mentioned uh, before, I obviously had to look at Spanish sources um, to a large extent. So I looked at mostly um, memoirs of both commanders, ordinary soldiers, um, also obviously Spanish historians who have looked at the military aspect more. And I I found some really kind of fascinating insights in the memoirs of commanders on both sides, to be honest. Um, you've always got to be careful with, with the memoirs, particularly of commanders, because they obviously try and um, exonerate themselves to some extent. You know, why else would you write a memoir other than to make yourself and your life seem good um, or worthy of note? Mm-hmm. So one, for example, that I had to be really careful using was the memoir of a guy that was known in the Spanish Civil War as El Campesino, the peasant um, his real name was Valentin Gonzalez, um, and he was a communist uh, guy, a peasant, like his nickname suggests. He was illiterate, um, and his only real qualification was his kind of cult following and his charisma. He apparently, when given a military map, um, turned it upside down and laid it out as a tablecloth uh, <laughs> for his room. And he kind of gets um, a lot of abuse, I would say, in other commanders' memoirs as being someone who really just wasn't very good. Um, also in the, the Spanish president's um, letters, some absolutely um, gold mine of kind of <laughs> frustrations at the fact these commanders don't even know how to use a map. Um, but his memoirs are really interesting because after World War II, El Campesino kind of um, saw the light in the sense that he he abandoned his communism. He ended up spending a bit of time in jail in the Soviet Union because a lot of uh, Spanish communists went to the Soviet Union after they'd lost the Civil War. Hmm. He escaped, um, possibly with uh, and was transported, I think, via Iran back to the West. Um, possibly, I think, there was some involvement there from American intelligence. And he then um, sat down to write his memoirs with one of the leading figures from the POOM, as the ghostwriter, the POOM being the Trotskyist group that was crushed by the communists in the Spanish Civil War. So obviously everyone, when writing a memoir, has a bias, but he's got a bit of an axe to grind because um, of all that I've kind of, that's happened to him. The fact his ghostwriter was a convinced anti-Salinist and the fact that his memoir and the work of the ghostwriter, they were kind of working to create a body um, of 
left-wing criticism of communism, if you get what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, so there was an organization called the Congress um, for Cultural Freedom, I think it was called, which was actually a CIA front, which basically recruited a load of left-wing writers who were anti-communist against the Soviet Union to basically produce in the 1950s a huge amount of literature that was critical of the Soviet Union from a left-wing viewpoint to try and obviously persuade people in the West who are left-wing mm -hmm. not to sympathize with the Soviet Union. So it was absolutely fascinating reading uh, his account, written during the Cold War, looking back at the Spanish Civil War and trying to unpick, hang on, he's saying that you know the communists did this and that, but what truth can we really get from this? And I found that really, um, really interesting. One... <laughs> One thing I should mention uh, is the fact that um, my own Spanish is is not is not what it could be. I mm -hmm. would say um, so. I I spent many an hour, many an evening, uh, unpicking old soldiers' memoirs and Spanish histories of the war with um, with my with my flatmate and good friend uh, Jose, mm -hmm. um, who is Spanish. Um, who was basically bribed with takeaway pizza <laughs> to spend his free time translating um, stuff that was probably quite dull to him mm. um, over a, a, quite a lengthy period of time. So I thought I really should give him a mention if we're gonna if we're gonna talk about sources. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, is there much in the way of uh, ger old German or Soviet sources or um, documents that provide information? That's uh, excellent kind of source of information. Um, there's a fantastic volume um, entitled Spain Betrayed, um, which is a huge collection of documents from the Soviet archives, which obviously were only opened up in the last 20 years or so, since, since the fall of the Soviet Union, of secret Soviet documents, basically concerning, obviously, their intervention in Spain, communication between Republican and Soviet leaders, International Brigade reports, internal communication, that sort of thing. And that collection, that volume, was m massively helpful to kind of see the kind of cut through the propaganda and see what they were really saying to each other mm -hmm. in secret. From the German point of view, again, there's a great collection um, after the Second World War was published from the German Foreign Office archives. So you can kind of get all the documentary stuff, evidence there to see, you know, what were these Nazis feeling about Spain at any given time. Mm -hmm. Usually it was frustration with Franco, who they didn't really, although they were sympathetic to, didn't really get on with on a personal level. Mm -hmm. And another really great source, actually, is the diary of Count uh, Giano, who was the Italian uh, foreign minister. Mm -hmm. uh, he was also Mussolini's uh, son-in-law. Mm -hmm. uh, his diary is absolutely um, fantastic in terms of giving the Italian perspective, obviously, on Spain. And he records some of Mussolini's rants about Franco, which, um, again, sympathetic to his cause, but didn't really like him as a person. Um, mm -hmm. I think for one example, when the nationalists were getting pegged back by the Republicans, I think at the Battle of the Ebro, apparently Giano records in, uh, Giano records in his diary that... Um, Mussolini it flew into a rage and said something along the lines of um, Franco calls himself a quiet, calm optimist. Well, calm optimists get run over by a tram. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there's some really great sources from the time that I, I really um, found a lot out of and, and occasionally find an odd gem as well. What, uh, in your research, what was the um, most surprising thing you discovered? Good question. Um one of the most surprising things, I think, was the fact that the Soviet reports that I mentioned are so, a lot of them are so strikingly honest about the, the mess that the Republican Army often is, the international brigades were, because um, maybe I had a bit of a, a preconception that, the, you know, Soviet Union, common term, so, uh, you know, they're going to be, you know, dressing things up. They're going to be kind of in double speak and kind of doing everything by the party line. And yeah, mm -hmm. to some extent, it creeps in sometimes that they just blame problems on, well, clearly it was Trotskyists 
within the ranks who must have been spreading this. But to a large extent, a lot of them, particularly reports of a guy called um, General Walter, who was a Pole who was part of the um, Soviet Red Army who was sent to Spain to kind of oversee the international brigades, is just totally honest about some of the real deficiencies that the um, international brigades had, the problems of demoralization, the, the, he even writes a report which is basically all the mistakes that Soviet advisors have made while in Spain. And one of the things that's quite striking that you read in his reports is that once the international brigades began to get a lot of Spaniards in their ranks because they'd suffered so many casualties, they had to introduce Spaniards and Spanish conscripts into the international brigades. Mm -hmm. There was a real problem um, with, I guess now, 21st century, we'd call it racism, <laughs> which even these volunteers who are generally, you know, left wing, progressive, and um, have covered, you know, risked a lot to come and fight for Spain and for the Spanish people, for the Republic. They've really locked down on the Spaniards they were fighting alongside. Um, they. Uh, General Walter, actually, in one of his reports, calls it um, German chauvinism, the fact that in the German unit within the international brigades, made up of you know exiled German communists and things like that who weren't welcome in Nazi Germany, mm -hmm. they always recorded exact figures for how many international volunteers were killed, wounded, and missing, but then would just give rough, rough estimates of how many Spaniards in their unit <laughs> had gone missing in the battle. Mm. Um, and it just struck me as really odd that, I guess it was a different time, it was the 1930s, so kind of racial prejudice and stereotypes were perhaps a bit more prevalent. But mm -hmm. even though they've gone to fight for Spain, for the Spanish Republic, they had such a low opinion of the Spanish Republican soldier. So yeah, that was something that was a bit of a eye well, opener. And maybe this is overblown, but I've I've read that the Spanish afternoon naps were still conducted during the war and that irritated a lot of foreign fighters <laughs> yeah there was um definitely um to some extent that went on um you had um you know in the really intense battles that i look at in detail you know that wouldn't be the case mm -hmm. because you're launching an offensive or whatever but a lot of the war you know a lot on the quiet fronts, um, which there was a lot of, the two sides would basically just kind of dig in on their trenches opposite each other and basically just be there for the duration and just kind of not very much would happen. Maybe the occasional raid, the occasional artillery barrage might be sent over. But in general, um, the historian James Matthews has actually written really well about this. He's done a study of conscripts in both armies. And he kind of puts it that actually for the majority of soldiers, for the ones who weren't the shock troops, like the international brigades, like some of the communist units, your main concern would be about keeping warm, keeping yourself well fed, much more than um, worrying about the enemy in the trenches opposite. You know, it wasn't even like trench warfare in World War One, where, you know, it was pretty often pretty grim being in the trenches and even in a quiet section of the line you'd suffer a fair few casualties it was a lot quieter on the quiet fronts in the Spanish Civil War George Orwell talks about it when he was on a quiet front um, he kind of says this is like a kind of almost a farce we're just kind of sitting here not really doing anything we can't attack them they can't attack us okay you know if, if we if we had a couple of mortars or something we could probably break through the defenses are so lax but um a lot of the fronts were really quite quiet and a lot of conscripts ended up just kind of holding the line for months on end without really doing very much hmm. which is um which is where you might get things like the the afternoon siesta observed and things like that mm -hmm. um and particularly, you would have seen that as well more in the kind of militia units, like I mentioned, where the discipline and training was not everything it could have been. Um, but the battles that I really tell the story of are really intense kind of battles that would be more in line with what you would see 
um, in, a, in a kind of World War scenario. Mm-hmm. Was there a question that, uh, or an issue that was particularly difficult for you to um, reach a conclusion on, or maybe you still don't have an answer for that you'd like to? Yeah, I try and, my last chapter in the book is kind of trying to assess the People's Army overall. Um, obviously, understandably, it gets a pretty bad you know, reputation. I mean, armies that lose wars generally aren't held in really high esteem by many people. Perhaps the exception to that might be the way that um, the German Second World War Army still has a lot of, a lot of fans. Um, but I, I, I try my best to come to a conclusion about the People's Army and really how militarily effective was it. I draw a comparison to the American Expeditionary Force of the First World War, just because it was another army built rapidly during a war. You know, you've got to remember this army is built in the middle of a war. Mm-hmm. It's not built before the war and then sent into action. And the American Expeditionary Force in the First World War has a pretty tough time of it. They don't obviously fight for that long, um, but they suffer pretty heavy casualties. I mean, there is, uh, I don't think it's undisputed. I think there's some question marks over some American Civil War battles, but the biggest battle, the 1918 First World War American army took part in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive is, in some historians' opinion, the bloodiest battle in American history, um, which is quite a thing to say. You know, mm-hmm. First World War battle is America's bloodiest battle. So they suffered from poor logistics, officers not really knowing what they were doing, soldiers going into battle against modern equipment, not 100% with the right tactics, mm-hmm. poor communication, and that explains that high casualty rate. And I kind of say, well, hang on, you apply that to Spain and the People's Army, and actually those are all the same problems that the, the People's Army had. I mean, they also had other problems, um, weapons and equipment being one, political division being another. But if a superpower, you know, with the resources that America has, finds it quite difficult to build an army midway through a war, can we forgive the Spanish Republic for not being able to build a massively successful force in the middle of a war whilst under embargo. But I think the thing that I found tricky was really coming to a definite conclusion of was the People's Army an effective fighting force? Was it an ineffective, hopeless fighting force? I end up obviously you know, trying to be nuanced and going somewhere in between. Um, but I, I would say that's a question that I think is is deserving of further study um, that hasn't really been studied in an English language very much. Mm-hmm. Did you have any difficulties getting the book finished or published? It's my it's my first book, so um, in an answer, yes. Um, mm-hmm. I absolutely loved the process of research and writing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also a I'm a history teacher at a, at a, a secondary school um, mm-hmm. in the UK, which is ages eleven to eighteen. So this has been a kind of passion project for me, um, which I've, I've kind of managed to fit alongside my work. Um, and hopefully I'm going to get to do more of that in the future. Um, Pen and Sword were, were really excellent um, in terms of I sent them the concept. And they haven't really, they kind of specialize in the world wars. Um, so they haven't got much about Spanish Civil War. So they were, you know, you know not willing to necessarily gamble everything and say yes straight away mm-hmm. um but uh, rupert harding a commissioning editor at the pen and sword was was super helpful along the way really encouraging and kind of said well look this is a really interesting concept can you kind of give us some of it and i i kind of obviously began to write it and put together some chapters and they they really liked it and were supportive um, at first, it was actually intended as a, just a military history of the Spanish Civil War, mm-hmm. full stop, um, from start to finish, uh, rather than a, an account specifically focused on the Republicans and the People's Army. And that idea kind of got knocked back, um, which was obviously pretty, um, you know, for someone who's never had something published, a bit of a setback. Mm-hmm. Um, but. What was, what was really good is that I was able to use my research and what I had written to kind of refocus and that Penn and Sword were really receptive to to that kind of change of direction and um, have, have taken the plunge um, in the end and 
and, and gone for it, which I think, you know, for a publisher, for someone who looking at an author who's not yet brought anything out, um, it is, 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 you know, it's commendable and I really appreciate the kind of faith that they've shown in me. So mm-hmm. fingers crossed, um, it's, a, it's a success. Yeah, I think that the angle you've taken is really interesting. Um, and I think one that makes it stand out and, and would make someone interested in this subject, you know, want to take a look. Um, mm-hmm. And actually anyone interested in military history, I think it's it's a nice, a nice angle um, to take. Yeah, I've really tried to pitch it at the kind of the fan of military history. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not, you don't have to be an expert on the Spanish Civil War to read it. Um, like I kind of mentioned in the structure element, I set out the Civil War in Spain, why it happened, what it was, who are the two sides. Mm-hmm. And if you like military history, if you like the world wars, I would say this is, you know, a sort of book that you would enjoy reading because I really focus in on, you know, the details of combat as well as the kind of grand strategy going on. I use a lot of first-hand accounts um, to kind of hopefully put the reader there in terms of what it was actually like fighting these battles and fighting in this army. So, you know, if you like the world wars, interested in the kind of clash of communism, fascism, Nazi Germany, Soviet Union and all the other things we've talked about, um, mm-hmm. then I think hopefully you'll find it an engaging read. Yeah, I, th- I think anyone interested in World War II needs to read about the Spanish Civil War, and especially if they feel like they've read everything or they've pretty much touched everything in World War II, they definitely have to have to look at this conflict. Um, That's kind of where I kind of came to it myself, because like I mentioned, you know, I was a big fan of the World Wars and but you kind of get to the point with World War Two where you kind of know the story, um, if you get what I mean, and you've kind of there's so much written about it that you, you you know all the key points and you know all the kind of the the touchstones of the Second World War and of its history, and that, that's kind of something that when I discovered the Spanish Civil War as a as a real interest, it was like wow, this is a you know very much a comparable conflict happening almost immediately before. Mm-hmm. Where we can see a lot of the same things going on, and, but it's a it's a kind of new story in a new area of history to get mm-hmm. get interested in. Um, what's your next writing project, or do you have one uh, sort of set yet? I I do. Um, I know I've just gone on a big um, kind of fan fan girl in there about um, <laughs> about pen and sword being so good to me, um, and they were good enough to. I basically came to them some months ago, um, well, actually about midway through last year, and said, look, I'd like to kind of follow up the People's Army with another title about the Spanish Civil War um, from a military perspective. And they, they, they said, absolutely, go for it. Um, so at some point, probably at the end of, the end of this year, um, we will be um, seeing a title I will be releasing a title called Fighting for Spain, which is uh, the International Brigade. So I really focus in on their story, where they came from, their their reasons for going, and then an in-depth military history. Like I said, people who've written about the International Brigades in the past have written about political, social, cultural history of it. Um, And this book, the, The Fighting for Spain, is redressing that balance to some extent by really zooming in on each international unit, the fighting that they did, how effective they were. And I kind of, that book's a lot more, so the People's Army is, you know, a traditional history book in the sense that it's, you know, tells you a story, it's a narrative, it's got some photographs and maps as well, whereas the fight, fighting for Spain is going to be more of a, um, more similar to, if you're familiar with the Osprey series um, of books. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Lots of maps and photographs. I think I've got about 20 maps, about 130 photographs, fact files and things, you know, like that of key leaders, weapons, things like that. Mm-hmm. So the Fighting for Spain is a bit more of a kind of coffee table book, if you like, mm-hmm. if you get what I'm saying, more of a reference book, mm-hmm. um, whereas the People's Army is a, is a narrative history that you can sit down and kind of read and, you know, take on a long journey or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with 50, you know, people coming from 50 different countries, I think it'd be nice to um, 
to be able to sit down and sort out what was going on instead of just thinking of the mm-hmm. international brigades as a just a big glob you yeah, know or you yeah. know kind of divided here and there between the different brigades absolutely uh, and, and I, i've tried to have a look at some of the other national groups as well because in english it's often either a book about the british or a book about the irish or a book about the americans mm-hmm. in spain and i've tried to try and take the whole the group the, the brigades as a whole you know all the different nationalities that mm-hmm. i can kind of that contribute significantly so uh where can people find you uh on the web do you have website social media um i have a uh twitter account um that would probably be the best place um called at histories most um which is actually um the reason it's got that name it's associated with a podcast that i co-host mm-hmm. um called histories most um where we uh, we pick kind of uh, kind of controversial or underreported topics um, and apply unnecessary superlatives to them. Mm-hmm. So um, the, we, each each episode is a different story where we go like history's most guilty man mm-hmm. or history's worst democracy or history's most disastrous voyage and things like this. Mm-hmm. So um, each episode's on something completely different, and we kind of just jump around. And we've talked a lot about kind of 20th century and military history because that's the interests of me and um, Peter, who I co-hosted with. But mm-hmm. we drop in other things, medieval as well. So um, if you were that way inclined, interested in history, which obviously if you're listening to this, I'm sure you are, but yeah. um, that's a social media account and a podcast that we would obviously uh, love you to get engaged with. Can you spell that out just to make sure I have I know it correctly? Um, so the Twitter account is at History's Most, just the words put together, um, and the podcast is called History's Most with apostrophe S. As in, yeah. Okay, so it's History apostrophe S Most. Yeah, exactly right. Okay, but without the apostrophe, I assume. With the without Twitter. the apostrophe for the Twitter handle, yeah. Got it. Okay, good, good. That's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? Just, uh, I want to say thank you, Chris, for this um, opportunity. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would, I guess, say to the listeners, you know, the Spanish Civil War is something that I think a lot of people might have heard of, but don't know that much about. But it's uh, honestly, it's a, it's a really fascinating period of history where whether you're interested in art, military history, as I'm sure our listeners are here, politics, culture, social change, it has got something for everyone. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, this this has been a fascinating talk, and definitely people need to read your book and other books on uh, Spanish Civil War. Um, Yeah, so thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening. You can find more podcasts like this on your favorite podcast feed under the title Military History Inside Out. That includes Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. One great way to support me is to rate my podcasts, either good or bad. You can find more great military history information at warscholar.org, on YouTube at Warscholar1945, on Facebook at Warscholar, on Instagram at Chris Alvarez Warscholar, and on Twitter at War Scholar. Please support me by following me on those sites and liking my videos. If you like to read, don't forget to sign up for my weekly newsletter where I recommend newly published books. The subscription box is on my webpage. Thank you.